Hello and welcome back to Zoology 142, Human Anatomy and Physiology. The final lecture of the semester will be on genetics and inheritance. So first off we're going to start out with an explanation of genetics. Genetics is the study of genes and their transmission from one generation to the next. That is the transmission of your genes to your offspring or the transmission of your parents genes to you. So as many of you already know, Gregor Mendel is considered the father of genetics. So Gregor Mendel was an Augustinian monk who did genetic experiments on pea plants back in the 1850s and 1860s. And his experiments showed how certain phenotypic traits such as flower color, uh, the number of peas in a pod, and also the height of plants is passed down from generation to generation. So through Mendel's experiments, we came to understand how certain genetic traits are passed on from parent to offspring. So if you remember back to last semester, we said that a gene is a short segment of DNA that codes for a certain type of protein. So it's kind of like a recipe or a blueprint for a protein. And we said that genes are located on the DNA molecules and that all the DNA in your cells is like a giant cookbook with lots and lots of different recipes. And so the presence of these genes determines which inherited traits you will exhibit. And so we know now that there's approximately 24,000 genes in the human genome. And this number is a lot lower than we used to think it was because the study of genetics, uh, specifically human genetics, is one where there's a lot of new work going on all the time. Now what we do know about genetics is that you inherit two copies of most genes. You get one of these from your mother and one from your father. And these genes again are located on chromosomes. So you should remember from the last chapter that we said that diploid cells in our body contain 23 pairs of chromosomes. And we say these are chromosome pairs because one chromosome in the pair comes from mom and the other chromosome came from your dad. Now the chromosomes that you have can be divided into two groups, the autosomes and the sex chromosomes. As you probably already know, the sex chromosomes are the ones that determine your gender. For example, if you're a female, you will have two X chromosomes, whereas if you're a male, you'll have an X and a Y chromosome. So we said in the last slide that chromosomes traditionally occur in pairs and that one chromosome of the pair will come from your mother and the other chromosome from the pair will come from your father. So we say these are homologous pairs. Now homologous pairs code for similar types of structures in the body but they may or may not contain the exact same information. Usually it's similar information, that is it tends to code for similar types of structures but the actual recipe on the chromosomes tends to be different. You can imagine these as being two different chapters from two different cookbooks. For example, if you open up a cookbook to a chapter on cookies and another cookbook to a chapter on cookies, they both might have recipes, let's say for chocolate chip cookies, but these recipes might be slightly different. And so in this way, homologous chromosomes tend to carry similar types of information, but this information is usually not the same. Now I just want to refresh your memory a little bit about chromosomes. We said that chromosomes contain DNA, and that's true, but it's DNA wrapped around proteins called histones. Now sometimes you'll see a homologous pair of chromosomes shown as single chromatids, as you see here, and other times you may see a homologous pair where both of the chromosomes have two chromatids. Now the reason you might see chromosomes represented as having either one chromatid or two chromatids is dependent on whether or not these chromatids have had a chance to replicate. Remember that in mitosis or prior to mitosis that we replicate all the chromosomes in the body so that the two daughter cells will each have a copy of each chromosome. So here on the left you can see two chromosomes of the homologous pair and during the S phase of interphase these chromatids are replicated. So if you look at the yellow chromosome on the left, you can see now that it has two sister chromatids. And it's important to realize here that these sister chromatids are genetically identical to each other. That is, they are exact duplicates. This can also be said for the homologous chromosome on the right side of the screen. It has two sister chromatids that are genetically identical to one another. The big point you should get here is that these two chromosomes, when compared left to right, contain similar but not the same information because remember, one comes from mom and one comes from dad. That's why we call them a homologous pair. Now just to drive this point home, we're going to take a look at three genes located on our homologous pair. Now remember, the homologous pair consists of two chromosomes, one from our mother and one from our father. So we'll say that our mother's chromosome is on the left and the chromosome that we inherited from our father is on the right. Now there are three genes located on both these chromosomes. Let's take a look at the gene for eye color located at the top. 
we can see that the gene for eye color expressed on our father's chromosome looks different than the gene for eye color expressed on our mother's chromosome. That is, these are two different versions of that gene, and later on we'll learn that these are called alleles. The same for enzyme A. We don't need to worry what enzyme A is right now, but we can see that our mother's chromosome has a different version than our father's chromosome. And this is also the case for cytochrome C, a uh, second type of gene. We can see there are two different versions, the purple one from our mother and the white one for our father. So remember, these two different forms of a gene are called alleles. So an allele is one of several possible forms of a gene. Remember, a gene is a recipe and that we can have slight variations on a recipe. For example, again, think about the chocolate chip cookies. You might read in one cookbook that has a recipe that calls for nuts or caramel, and the second recipe might call for a little bit of vanilla or even some bourbon or something like that. Both of these are recipes for chocolate chip cookies, but because the recipes are different, we say that they're different alleles. And different alleles produce slightly different proteins. It's important to realize that because we get chromosomes from our mother and our father, you receive two alleles for every gene. Now, these alleles may be exactly the same, that is the same recipe, in which case we say that you're homozygous, homo meaning the same, or these two recipes might be different, in which case we say you're heterozygous for that gene, and hetero here means different. So here we can see a homologous pair of chromosomes from some pea plants. And if we look at the exact same location on both of these chromosomes, we'll be able to see the alleles for flower color. And here you can see that one of the chromosomes has an allele for purple flowers, whereas the other chromosome has an allele for white flowers. So in this case, we would say that you are heterozygous for flower color because there are two different versions of the flower color allele. So the genotype of an organism is basically the alleles that are present. Remember that for each gene, you get two copies of that gene, and that these copies may be different or they may be the same. So the phenotype, on the other hand, is the actual appearance of an organism. For example, the fact that this chicken has red and black feathers. The phenotype is a result of the expression of the genotype. That is, we have genes that code for feather color, and those genes are transcribed and translated to give us the various colors that we see in this rooster here. However, it's very important to know that phenotype may also be dependent on environmental factors. So the big picture here is that the genotype, along with environmental factors, determine the phenotype. Remember, the genotype was the actual genes or alleles that were present, whereas environmental factors include things like nutrition, stress, and other things that affect the phenotype. So here we see two examples of common human phenotypes. On the left we see eye color, and on the right we see muscularity. So the question is, uh, to what extent do you think that genetic or environmental factors determine these two phenotypes? Well, as you probably already know, eye color is pretty much exclusively determined by our genotype. That is, the genes we get from our mom and our dad determine what our eye color will be. On the other hand, muscularity is not only determined by genotype, but it also has a strong environmental component. This guy probably has some pretty muscular genes in his background, true, but he probably also worked out a whole lot, probably even took some steroids. So in this case, uh, muscularity would probably have a greater environmental component than it does a genetic component. If you want to see just how important our genotype is uh, in determining our phenotype, you should take a look at identical twins. Now remember, identical twins are derived from the same fertilized egg or zygote, so they contain exactly the same genes. And so examples of identical twins that you're probably familiar with are Ashley and Mary-Kate Olson. Now in this case you might say, well their face is the same, but you know the hair color is different. Well, that's because one of them's been coloring their hair. But otherwise they look identical, they're identical twins. And that's because they share exactly the same genes. So here's another pair of famous identical twins, Tia and Tamara Maori. Uh, they were on the 1990s sitcom Sister Sister. I never saw it, but I found them in a search for famous identical twins. You can see that they look very, very similar. Again, they share the same genes. The one on the left, her face is maybe a little bit plumper than the one on the right. And that would probably just be because of environmental factors. Maybe she eats a little bit more. Maybe the one on the right uh, diets a little bit more frequently. But otherwise, they look very, very similar.
but here's another group of identical twins. Now these aren't famous twins, but you should notice that they look very, very different. They're identical twins in that they were derived from the same zygote, they share exactly the same genes, but they look quite different. And that's because they have made different lifestyle choices. You can tell the one on the right is probably overeating, not exercising. Uh, from her face you can see she's got more wrinkles, maybe she was a smoker. The one on the left uh, looks about 100 pounds lighter, and so she's somebody that ended up having a gastric bypass, uh, she exercises a lot, watches what she eats. So even with identical twins, uh, environmental factors are still pretty important in determining the phenotype. So now let's take a look at non-identical siblings. These are siblings that come from the same parents, so they had the same mother and father, but they're derived from separate eggs and sperm. So they tend to look more different than the identical twins do, but they still share some similarities in phenotype. So on the left you have Casey Affleck, on the right you have Ben Affleck. They don't look that much alike, uh, and that's because they get different genes in the sperm and egg that united to form the two separate zygotes. And here's two celebrity sibs that you probably didn't even know were related. On the left is River Phoenix, and on the right is Joaquin Phoenix. Now, they're taken in different ages, but you can see that River Phoenix has a different jaw structure, facial structure, than Joaquin Phoenix does. The hair texture and color is different as well, and you probably already noticed that Joaquin Phoenix has this congenital cleft palate that's been repaired uh, on his upper lip. So, big picture here is that siblings can look very different. And here we have yet another pair of non-identical siblings. We've got Randy Quaid on the left and Dennis Quaid on the right. Now, which one is more likely to be cast in a movie as a leading role? Well, you probably already know it's Dennis Quaid. And you might say, well, it's because he has better acting abilities and maybe acting abilities aren't genetic, but also his appearance is more geared towards the silver screen. He has a very uh, square chin, a nice full head of hair, where is Randy Quaid on the right? Uh, he's almost bald, his face is a little bit uh, poofier, uh, he has a little bit more body fat that's partially genetic, partially environmental. So even though they have the same parents, because they're derived from separate eggs and sperm, they look very different because they have different genes. And finally, we'll end this little slideshow with a trio of celebrity siblings. And again, these are siblings that are not genetically identical. On the left, you have Andrew Wilson. Uh, in the middle, you have Luke Wilson. And of course, on the right, you have Owen Wilson. Now you can notice that their height uh, is a little bit different, particularly if you see that Andrew Wilson tends to be fairly tall, where Luke Wilson and Owen Wilson tend to be a little bit shorter. The other thing you'll notice is that the hair color is different between Owen Wilson and Luke Wilson. Eh, that might actually be a dye job. But you'll also notice the noses are a little bit different. Again, Owen Wilson might have had some corrective surgery there. But the big picture here is that among non-identical siblings, they tend to have a lot of variation in phenotype because they have variation in their genes. But how can that be possible? They have the same mother and the same father. So in the next few slides, we'll figure out just what contributes to the great genetic and phenotypic variation among non-identical siblings. So the reasons why offspring from the same parents can look so different can be boiled down to three sources of genetic variation. These include independent assortment, random fertilization, and crossing over. So the first source of genetic variation is something called independent assortment. An independent assortment has to do with the movement of chromosomes or homologous pairs during the process of meiosis. And remember, meiosis is the process that we use to divide up our chromosomes when we're making gametes, such as eggs and sperm. So we have a normal cell that has 46 chromosomes, and we want to divide that up into two or four cells that have 23 chromosomes. And so let's take a look at the panel at top left. You can see in this photo we have uh, a parent cell that has three homologous pairs. We'll say that the purple chromosomes here came from your father, and the green chromosomes came from your mother. Now, one way to divide these up is simply to take two gametes and put all of her father's chromosomes in those two, and two gametes and put all of her mother's chromosomes in those two. Because remember, in spermatogenesis, we get up to four spermatozoa for each diploid spermatogonium. On the other hand, you can see at the photos at right and on bottom, we can flip around how these chromosomes move into the cells so that the cells will contain a combination of both maternal and paternal chromosomes.
and if you want to figure out the total number of combinations that are possible through independent assortment, you simply take 2 to the n power. In this case, n is the number of chromosome pairs that we have, so it would be 2 to the 23rd power. And if you get out your calculator and you do that, you'll find that 2 to the 23rd is somewhere around 8.4 million combinations. That is, just through the process of independent assortment, we can get 8.4 million different gametes. So if you remember from the last slide, we said that the process of independent assortment alone gives us some 8.5 million different types of gametes. That is, genetically different gametes just through the process of independent assortment. Now we're going to throw in the factor of random fertilization. That is, when fertilization is taking place, the sperm that fertilizes the egg is pretty much randomly determined. It's all based on chance. And so if we look at 8.5 million different types of sperm, and that which one of these is going to fertilize this egg, we get another 8.5 million added to the factor. In fact, the total variation that can be determined here is 8.5 times 8.5. That is, we have 8.5 million different sperm that can be created just out of the process of independent assortment, and then we have random fertilization, which generates another 8.5 million chances, and so we multiply these together and find out that just through these two processes, random fertilization and independent assortment, we can generate some 72 trillion different types of zygotes. So independent assortment and random fertilization generate a whole lot of genetic variability just in themselves. Now we're going to talk about a third factor that increases the amount of genetic variability among gametes even more, and this process is called crossing over. So remember that meiosis involves two sets of divisions. We have meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. Well, during meiosis 1, some pretty strange stuff happens. That is, we have homologous pairs synapsing and forming something called a tetrad. While these things are forming a tetrad, they will actually exchange genetic information between your mom's chromosome and your dad's chromosomes so that the chromosomes that come out of this meiosis 1 will be sort of a chimera or a combination of both mom's genetic code and dad's genetic code. And we call these chromosomes recombinant chromosomes. So let's take a look at how this process happens. Here we have a homologous pair of chromosomes that code for, uh, let's say, hair color, H, and eye color, E. And we can see that the purple chromosome, will say, comes from dad, and the green chromosome comes from mom. Now remember, during meiosis 1, this swapping of DNA occurs between the two chromosomes and the homologous pair. You can see that dad's chromosome, the purple one, is getting a little frisky with mom's chromosome. They're interlacing their sister chromatids, and when they do this, some of the DNA from mom's chromosome will swap with some of the DNA from dad's chromosomes. So already during meiosis 1, we've generated uh, sister chromatids that are not genetically identical to one another. You can see that just through the process of genetic recombination or crossing over, we'll generate gametes that are not genetically identical. So when we take crossing over, we combine it with independent assortment and random fertilization, we see that there's almost an infinite number of possible gametes that can be generated during the process of meiosis. And that's the reason that offspring look so different, even though they have the same parents. So in summary, you should remember that there are three factors that determine the genetic diversity of gamete production. These include crossing over, independent assortment, and also random fertilization. If you still don't understand how these concepts work, click on the link below to review the process of meiosis and learn how these three processes increase the amount of genetic variation uh, among offspring and siblings. Okay, so now that we've learned about the factors that contribute to the genetic diversity among siblings, we're going to go back and talk again about alleles. Remember, alleles were alternate forms of a gene, and you inherit two copies of each genes from your parents, one from mom and one from dad. Now, if the copies are exactly the same, we say that you are homozygous for that gene, whereas if the copies are different, we say that you're heterozygous. Remember, homo means the same, and hetero means different. So to demonstrate an example of a homozygous pair, we're going to look at a homologous pair uh, from some pea plants. And so we're looking on mom's chromosome at top and dad's chromosome on the bottom, and we can see if we look in the exactly same place on these two chromosomes, we can see the allele for flower colors.
you can see up top that we have an allele for purple flowers and on the bottom we also have an allele for purple flowers. So in this case we would say that this individual would be homozygous because both alleles are exactly the same. Now on the other hand it's possible that we inherit different versions of this gene from both mom and dad. So here we see an example of a heterozygous individual. We have both chromosomes of the homologous pair, mom up top, dad on the bottom, but here you can see that we have two different versions of the flower color gene. The one up top will code for purple flower colors, where the one on the bottom codes for white flower colors. Now because these are two different forms, we say that this individual with this genotype is heterozygous, that is, it has two different copies. Now you should remember that genotype is eventually translated to become phenotype. So you should be asking yourself, what would a pea plant that's heterozygous for flower color look like? I mean it has one copy of a gene that says it should be purple, and the other copy says it should be white. So will the individual be purple, will it be white, or will it be pink? So the answer to that question will really depend on what type of inheritance is at play. We can have simple dominant recessive inheritance in which one gene trumps the other gene. We can have incomplete dominance in which the two different genes result in an intermediate phenotype. We can have sex-linked inheritance and also polygenic inheritance. So let's start out with the simplest example which is dominant recessive inheritance, that is where we have allele dominance. So in many cases one allele or one form of the gene will dominate or mask the other. That is, the one dominant form will be expressed whereas the other one will not be expressed. So recessive alleles tend to be only expressed if both copies are recessive. For example, if you get a dominant allele from your mom and a recessive allele from your dad, the dominant allele will be expressed. The only way that you can express a recessive genotype is if both alleles are recessive. Now table 29.1 in your textbook lists some common dominant traits or phenotypes, that is phenotypes that result from the presence of one or more of the dominant alleles. And these include things like tongue rolling, astigmatism, freckles, and so on. And we're going to go through a few examples of, of these in the next slides. Just keep in mind that the dominant phenotype or trait is expressed even if only just one of the alleles is dominant. So here we just need to have a note about how we denote a dominant versus a recessive allele. Well we denote dominant alleles by uppercase letters and recessive alleles by lowercase letters. Now what the letter is doesn't really matter. We tend to choose a letter that stands for the first name of the trait. For example, these might be alleles for tongue rolling. A big R indicates you have a dominant allele, whereas the little r means you have a recessive allele. Now remember you have two alleles for every gene. These alleles can be the same or they can be different. For example, it's possible that you might have two of the dominant alleles. In this case we would say you are homozygous dominant and we would denote that by having two uppercase letters. In this case big R, big R. It's also possible to be homozygous recessive. That is you have two copies of the recessive allele little r, little r. And In this case the recessive phenotype would be expressed. And finally, you can be heterozygous. Remember, hetero just means different, so you have two different copies of the allele. That is, your big R, little r, or little r, big r. And the order of the r's here doesn't make any difference. As long as you have one big R and one little r, you're said to be heterozygous. And in the case of complete allele dominance, you're going to have the dominant phenotype, just like somebody that's homozygous dominant. The only chance you have of expressing the recessive phenotype is having both copies of the gene being recessive, that is, like little r, little r. So let's look at some examples. The first example of a trait that is dominant is something called the tongue roller trait. That is, the ability to form your tongue into a taco or a u-shape. I remember when I was a kid I would have friends that could do this and I would be like why can't I do this you know I would stick my finger onto my tongue try to roll it around there well it turns out it's not because I'm inept at manipulating my tongue but in fact that I have the recessive genotype that is I have two copies of the little r allele and so if this person's able to roll their tongue they're either big r big r or big r little r so they're either homozygous dominant or heterozygous. 
both of these individuals would be able to roll their tongue just the same. So what this tells us is that if we know somebody's phenotype, we should be able to predict their genotype. If they're a tongue roller, they're either big R, big R, or big R, little r. Now let's ask the question, what will these genotypes below look like? Well, if we have somebody that's big R, little r, we already said that they would be a tongue roller, as would somebody with big R, big r. They would be a tongue roller too, because they're homozygous dominant. What about little r, little r? These people would not be able to roll their tongue. They would be like me. They would be shunned by their friends because they're unable to roll their tongue because they're homozygous recessive. Another trait that's based on the presence of dominant alleles is the widow's peak. You can see this woman's holding her hair back and that she has this deep V of hair going down on her scalp. She sort of looks like the Munster family, if you remember that. You know, they have these deep Vs, uh, deep widow's peaks on their forehead. And so, again, the widow's peak is determined by the presence of a dominant allele. And so this person has a widow's peak, so she must either be big W, big W, which is homozygous dominant, or she's big W, little w, heterozygous. So either way, she's going to show the widow's peak phenotype because widow's peak is a dominant trait that is determined by the presence of a dominant allele. Yet another trait that's determined by the presence of dominant alleles is the presence of mid-digital hair. Now, mid-digital hair is the hair that you have on your middle phalanx. That's the middle digit of your finger right there. You can see I'll highlight it here. And so there may not be much hair, but if you have any hair whatsoever on your middle phalanx, that's because you have the presence of one or more dominant alleles. So if you have hair on your digits, that would mean that you're big M, big M, homozygous dominant, or big M, little m, heterozygous. If you don't have any hair on your middle phalanx, that means that you are homozygous recessive. That is, you have little m, little m. Now let's take a look at a phenotype that people like to have. People love to have dimples, and dimples are those divots in your cheeks that form when you smile. And again, dimples is formed by the presence of one or more dominant alleles. So because this woman has dimples, we know that she's either big D, big D, homozygous dominant, or she's big D, little d, heterozygous. Now think about it and take a look in the mirror and ask yourself if you have dimples. If you have dimples, then you are either homozygous dominant or heterozygous. If you don't have dimples, it means you're homozygous recessive. That is little d, little d. Now, from the last slide, let's say that you have dimples, but that you somehow know that you're heterozygous. That means you have one dominant copy of the gene and one recessive copy of the gene, and that in your body, the dominant form is expressed. But let's think about what would happen if you were to have kids. Now remember, in the process of spermatogenesis or oogenesis, we go through the process of meiosis. And during meiosis, we have the number of chromosomes in each cell, so that each sperm cell or each egg cell gets only one copy of this particular gene. So your egg or sperm might get a big D, or it might get a little d, but it can't get both. Now don't forget, not only is this process going on in your body, but it's also going on in your spouse. So let's say you're a heterozygous, and now you're making sperm that are either big D or little d, and let's say that your wife is also heterozygous, so she's making eggs that are either big D or little d. So knowing this, we should be able to predict not only the genotypes of possible offspring, but also the chances of getting the dimples phenotype. And the way that we do this is using something called a Punnett square. A Punnett square is used to predict the outcome of a particular mating event. So let's look first at the father's genotype. We're saying that the father is big D, little d. That is, he's heterozygous for dimples. Your, the father, in this case, has dimples because dimples is the dominant trait. Now let's look at the mother. We're going to say that the mother's genotype, in this case, is also heterozygous, big D, little d. And so the mother will also have dimples. So the question here is, what are the baby's possible genotypes? And the way to do this is we divide up a square with four quadrants. Now let's look first at the leftmost quadrant. And this would be what would happen if our little d sperm 
from dad got together with our big D egg from the mother. In this case, we'd have a heterozygous embryo, or little d, big D. Now let's look and say what would happen if the little d sperm from our dad got together with our little d egg from mom, and we'd have a zygote that would be little d, little d, or homozygous recessive. Again, go down the bottom. What would happen if we had our father sperm that was big D get together with our mother sperm that was also dominant, or big D? And there we'd have a zygote that is big D, big D, or homozygous dominant. And finally, it was possible that we, our father's big D sperm got together with our mother's little d egg, in which case we'd have another heterozygote, or big D, little d. So big picture here is that if we know mom and dad's genotype, we should be able to predict the frequency of genotypes among the offspring. We would know that if two heterozygotes mate, that 25% of their offspring will be homozygous dominant, 25% will be homozygous recessive, and 50% will be heterozygous. Now, knowing this, we should also be able to predict the probability that any given child will have dimples. And so if you look at the genotypes in the square, you should remember that the heterozygotes, as well as the homozygous dominants, will express the dimples phenotype and that only the homozygous recessive individuals will not have dimples. So in this case, there is a 75% chance that the baby will have dimples, or 3 out of 4, and a 25% chance that the baby will not have dimples, or 1 out of 4. Now let's take a look at the same mating event, but now let's change our mother's genotype to big D, big D. That is, she's homozygous dominant what are the chances she's going to have a child that does have dimples or does not have dimples? Well, let's take a look at the mating event. In the left-hand square, we get little d, big D, which is heterozygous. In the right-hand square, we get little d, big D, which again is heterozygous. In the bottom left square, we see that we get big D, big D, homozygous dominant. And in the far right square, we see that we also get big D, big D, homozygous dominant. So in here, the chances of getting the homozygous dominant trait is 50%, and the chances of getting a heterozygous event is also 50%. The chances of getting a homozygous recessive is zero, and that's because mom has two dominant forms of the genes. So the answer here to what is the probability that the baby will have dimples is 100%. So when we talk about sex-linked inheritance, we're talking about traits that are inherited by genes that are on the sex chromosomes. Now it's important to realize that the X and Y chromosomes are not equal. Now they both contain information that will help determine our gender, but the X chromosome contains lots of other genes as well. It contains some 2,500 genes, whereas the Y chromosome contains less than 78 genes. And most of those genes on the Y chromosome are really just for determining maleness. So X-linked genes are genes that are found only on the X chromosome. Now it's important to realize that females get two copies of the X chromosome, one from their mother and one from their father, whereas males just get one copy, and that copy always comes from our mother. Now let's say that one of the chromosomes in our female has a disorder on it. Well, if there's a disorder or a mutation on it, oftentimes that other functional X chromosome uh, will be enough to make sure that that person has a normal phenotype. On the other hand, if we have a male child that has uh, a similar error on the X chromosome, it only has one copy, and if that copy's bad, that's going to result in a genetic abnormality or disorder in that male child. And for this reason, it's more common to have X-linked disorders uh, show up in male children than it is in female children. And examples of sex-linked disorders include things like hemophilia and red-green color blindness. So color blindness, or not being able to distinguish red from green, is an example of a sex-linked recessive disorder. And so the genes to be able to distinguish red from green are carried on the X chromosome. And remember that females have two copies of the X chromosome, one they got from their mother and one that they got from their father, whereas males only have one X chromosome, which they got from their mother. The Y chromosome came from their father.
and so depending on whether they have a normal allele or a colorblind allele on their X chromosome will determine whether or not these individuals are colorblind. So in this case, we're denoting normal color vision with a big C and colorblind individuals with a little c. And we list these as superscripts adjacent to the sex chromosomes. So let's take a look at your mother's genotype, which is X big C, X little c. And remember, your mother's genotype contains two X's because that means she's female. And so let's say that she's heterozygous for the color blindness gene. She has one bad copy, little c, and one good copy, big C. Now let's take a look at the father's genotype. Let's say the father has perfect color vision. So he would have an X big C and a Y. Remember, the Y chromosome basically just determines maleness and doesn't have anything to do with eye color. And so the father is X big C, Y. Now let's look at what are the odds that this couple will have a colorblind child. Well, first let's look at the top left hand side of the screen. If your father produces a sperm that has a Y chromosome and your mother produces an egg that has an X little c, that will end up being an X little c, Y, or a male that is colorblind. On the other hand, if one of your father's sperm bearing the Y chromosome fuses with one of your mother's eggs that has the normal X chromosome with a normal color gene on it, it would be X big C, Y, or a male that has normal color vision. Now let's look down below. Let's say your father, instead of passing on a Y chromosome, passes on the X big C chromosome. That would give you X big C, X little c. So because there's two X's there, that would be a female, and it would be a female with one good copy and one bad copy. So she would be heterozygous for color blindness, but because it's a recessive disorder, she would not express the disorder. We would say that she is a carrier. And finally, let's say that one of the sperms from your father that is X big C joins with your mother's egg that is also X big C. In this case, there would be two normal forms of the gene. So this person would be homozygous and have two active forms of the gene, and of course they would not be colorblind. So knowing this information, you should be able to predict what is the possibility that this couple will have a child that is colorblind. First of all, what's the probability that they're going to have a boy? Well, it's 50%, and that's the same as the probability they're going to have a girl. The probability that they'll have a boy with color blindness would be 25%, or 1 out of 4. The probability that they would have a girl with color blindness would be 0, and that's because the father is passing on the X big C allele. So there's a 0% chance that if they have a girl, that that girl will be color blind. And that's why X-linked disorders are much more rare in females because basically they have to inherit two bad copies of the gene, whereas males only have to inherit one bad copy. So, so far we've talked about dominant recessive inheritance, we've talked about sex-linked inheritance, now we need to say a word about incomplete dominance. Um, so incomplete dominance is fairly rare in people, but it's fairly common in plants. And so imagine if you had a pea plant with red flowers and a pea plant with white flowers, what would happen if you mated those two together? Well, if we have incomplete dominance operating, we could actually have an offspring that has a phenotype that is intermediate between the two parents. That is, if we had a red parent and a white parent, we mate those together, we could end up with an offspring that has pink flowers. Now, as I said, incomplete dominance is fairly rare among people, but one example of incomplete dominance is sickle cell. Now, sickle cell is a gene that determines whether or not we have normal hemoglobin made for our red blood cells. So the dominant genotype here is to have two big S's. That is, we have two functional forms of the hemoglobin gene, and so we make normal hemoglobin. On the other hand, it's possible to have something called sickle cell anemia, and that's where we have two defective forms of the gene, and as a result, we produce a hemoglobin that is abnormal, and it often makes the blood cells form these little sickle shapes, as we see in the next slide. So that would be if we have two sort of the recessive alleles. But now let's take a look at the heterozygote. In heterozygous individuals with normal dominance, the dominant allele usually masks the recessive allele. But that's not the case here with incomplete dominance. This person will have sort of some normal hemoglobin and some abnormal hemoglobin. So they will express something called sickle cell trait. They won't be the same as somebody that's homozygous dominant or the same as somebody that's homozygous recessive, but instead they'll be somewhere intermediate to that.
So here we can see a red blood cell from somebody that has sickle cell anemia. That is, they have two defective forms of the gene. So they would be little s, little s. And people with sickle cell anemia are at risk for sickle cell crisis. Uh, if they're running, doing anything like that, uh, the blood cells can clot up on each other and cause uh, a life-threatening event. Now, on the other hand, somebody can have sickle cell trait. That is, if they have one big S and one little s. And they will then have some functional forms of regular hemoglobin and some of the abnormal forms of hemoglobin. So they won't be as healthy as somebody with two normal forms of the sickle cell hemoglobin gene. But sometimes being a carrier or having sickle cell trait can actually have its advantages. For example, if you take a look at the prevalence of the sickle cell gene and transpose that onto the prevalence of, let's say, malaria infections, you'll see that areas of the world that have some of the highest malarial infections actually also have some of the highest frequencies of sickle cell. And that's because having sickle cell trait somehow gives you a partial immunity or ability to deal with malarial infection. So you don't want to have little s, little s, because then you have sickle cell. But if you're little s, big s, you are somewhat less susceptible to the vagaries of getting malarial infections, which can be life-threatening. So another type of inheritance is something called multiple allele inheritance. And that's an inheritance where you have more than two different versions of a gene. You could have three or four or five. And so a good example of multiple allele inheritance is blood typing. That is our ABO blood groupings. So there are three different alleles that determine blood type. You can either have an I big A, an I big B, or a little i. And so each person will only have two of these alleles. And so their blood type will be determined by which of the two alleles they have. For example, if you have type O blood type, that's because you have two copies of the recessive allele. That is little i, little i. Whereas if you have type A blood, you can either be big I A, big I A, or big I A, little i. On the other hand, if you have type B blood, you can be uh, homozygous dominant, that is have two big B's, or you can have a big B and also a little i. Or if you're like me and you have type AB blood, that means you have an I big A, I big B. And as it turns out, AB blood is very, very rare, uh, particularly among whites and blacks. That is less than 4% of the US population will have AB blood. So as a result, I get lots and lots of calls from the blood bank. And finally, probably one of the most complicated types of inheritance is something called polygene inheritance or polygenic inheritance. And this is where we have traits that are determined by multiple genes spread out sometimes on different chromosomes throughout our genome. And what this results in is a blending of characteristics, a continuous phenotypic variation between two extremes within the population. And examples of polygene traits include things like skin color, uh, eye color, height, intelligence, and metabolic rate. You know, skin color, you're not either just black or white, but you can be anywhere in between. And that's because the trait of skin color is determined by multiple genes. Okay, just a reminder that genotype is not the only thing that helps determine our phenotype. The phenotype is also influenced by environmental factors. For example, here we have a picture of two identical twins, that is, two individuals derived from the same egg and sperm, but they look quite different. And that's because of nutrition and also exercise. The guy on the right has been eating better, and also he's been working out, so he looks a lot different than his twin on the left-hand side. So it's important to realize that things like nutrition, uh, nurturing environments, uh, hormonal deficits can all lead to differences in phenotype, even though the genotype might be the same. So to this point, you know that our phenotypes are determined primarily by our genes, but also by environmental factors. And we said in Zoology 141 that our genes are located on chromosomes that are in our nucleus. And those are the only things that determine the genetic contribution to the phenotype. Well, eh, it's not really true. We're going to talk about some non-traditional forms of inheritance where genetic outcomes are influenced by things other than just our DNA that's inside of our nucleus. And so examples of non-traditional inheritance include the presence of something called small RNAs, the presence of epigenetic marks, and also extranuclear inheritance, that is mitochondrial DNA. So we're going to take a look at a couple of these in some detail. So some of these non-traditional methods of inheritance involve the regulation of gene expression.
Now we said before that the human genome contains some 24,000 different genes, but it's important to realize that this is actually only a small fraction of the DNA that we have in our genome. That is only about 2%. So up until recently, we thought that this 2% was really important and that the other 98% was just basically junk or noise. But now we're starting to understand that this sort of quiet DNA is important for regulating the transcription and translation of the active DNA, or exons. And as it turns out, there's several layers of complexity that help determine which genes are expressed and which genes are silenced. Because think about these 24,000 genes. They're not all being active in all your cells. For example, you have a gene for eye color. Well, that's not active in the cells in your big toe. And so there's a way to turn genes on and turn genes off. And the way that your body turns genes on and off is pretty complex. It involves some proteins, some small RNAs, and even things called epigenetic marks. So we'll talk about a couple of these in the successive slides. But before I do that, I should make a mention of mitochondrial DNA. If you remember back to Zoology 141, we said that all the DNA in your body is located on chromosomes, and those chromosomes are located inside your nucleus. Well, that's not entirely true. As it turns out, there's actually some DNA located in your mitochondria. Uh, the mitochondria contains DNA that has approximately 37 genes on it. And the interesting thing about this mitochondrial DNA is it's important, and it's inherited only from the mother. So it's transmitted from mother to son and mother to daughter. It's never transmitted from father to offspring. Now, the important thing to realize about mitochondrial DNA is because we only get one copy, if there's a defect in that copy, we can express a genetic disorder. And because the mitochondria uh, principally have genes dealing with metabolism, if we have uh, a problem with one of those genes, it's oftentimes going to result in some kind of metabolic disorder. But we also think that diseases like Parkinson's and even Alzheimer's may have at least in part to do with defects on the mitochondrial genome. So one really interesting example of non-traditional inheritance that we're just learning a lot about uh, recently is something called epigenetics, or the presence of epigenetic marks. Now remember from medical terminology that epi means on top of or around, and so epigenetic marks are marks that are not really in the DNA sequence, but are connected to the DNA molecules, and therefore can turn on a gene or turn off a gene by blocking the activity of the enzyme that does the transcription and translation, that is RNA polymerase. In order to understand how epigenetic marks work to either turn on or turn off a gene, it's first important that we review our understanding of transcription and translation. Now remember we said that all the DNA in your cells is like a giant cookbook and that it contains lots and lots of recipes. But the only way we can bring those recipes to fruition is to copy down those recipes in the process of transcription. So during transcription, an enzyme called RNA polymerase reads the DNA molecule and copies down a short segment into an mRNA molecule. This is called transcription. Now that mRNA molecule then moves outside of the nucleus and binds with a ribosome or polyribosome which undergoes the process of translation. That is, it reads that RNA transcript and using the materials in the cells assembles the amino acids together in the correct sequence in order to make a functional protein. The big picture here is that in order for this process to work, our RNA polymerase enzyme has to have access to the DNA molecule. However, when epigenetic marks are inserted onto the DNA, they can interrupt or block RNA polymerase from being able to transcribe the gene. If the gene cannot be transcribed, it can also not be translated. So, in effect, the presence of these epigenetic marks basically forms a roadblock for the RNA polymerase, which prevents it from expressing the gene. And so common examples of epigenetic marks are things like methyl groups. Methylation of the DNA tends to inactivate it by blocking the activity of the RNA polymerase enzyme. Now, the addition of epigenetic marks to the DNA happens naturally as a course of normal life cycles. That is, uh, when we form a zygote that has chromosomes from mom and dad, oftentimes we will label one of those chromosomes or genes on one chromosome with methyl groups or acetyl groups that will essentially turn one copy of the gene off and allow the other copy of the gene to be expressed. 
and this is a normal part of our own biology. Now what happens though in each successive generation is the epigenetic marks that were laid down in one zygote are erased in creating the gametes that will form the next zygote. And so this type of epigenetic marking is usually not heritable. So here's a diagram showing the importance of these epigenetic marks. So let's say we have a mouse that has ovary cells, and those ovary cells are very specialized. They are there to produce uh, oocytes. They don't have access to all the other genes in the genome because these genes are essentially turned off by the addition of these epigenetic marks. Now, however, when we produce that oocyte or the male produces sperm, those epigenetic marks are removed because, remember, we want the sperm and egg cells, once they form a zygote, to basically be able to come any type of cell in the mammalian body. And that way we can give rise to an embryo and later on a fetus. Now, as soon as that fetus is formed, its own cells will differentiate, epigenetic tags will be added, which will limit the types of cells they can become. However, when that individual grows up to become a mature adult mouse and it produces sperm or eggs, again, those epigenetic marks will be removed so that those cells can once again fuse and become essentially any cell in the mammalian body. So this is a normal process and we've known about these type of epigenetic marks for quite a long time. However, what we've learned in the past decade or so is that some epigenetic marks can be inserted onto the DNA by exposure to environmental variables, such as, let's say, exposure to certain toxins or smoking cigarettes or drinking excessive amounts of alcohol. This can cause similar methylation of our DNA, and this methylation can basically turn genes off, or in some cases turn them on. But what's even more interesting that we're learning is that some of these methylations, some of these marks that are left on the DNA of our own body can be passed on to our offspring and even generations beyond that. Now what's even more interesting is it's not just things like toxins or nicotine that can modify the epigenetic marks on our DNA, but also just things like nurturing. So there's this really cool experiment done with, I forget, it was either rats or mice, where they had two different populations. They had one mother rat that was very caring and would lick and groom her offspring in a normal way. Now, an offspring that was raised by this particular mother, it had normal expression of the GR gene. And this is a gene that codes for glucocorticoid receptors. Remember, glucocorticoids are things like cortisol, the stress hormone. And so these offspring have normal amounts of glucocorticoid receptors, and as a result, they tended to have low levels of cortisol in their body, uh, which is low stress hormone, and they had low anxiety, and as a result, they tend to be very diligent parents themselves, and they would lick their offspring and groom them accordingly. Now let's take a look at the same offspring that is from the same parent, but now raised by a different mother who was not very caring. She did not lick and she did not groom them. She was sort of a lackadaisical mother that didn't really care very much for her offspring. The offspring were fed normally, but what happened is that because they were not groomed or licked regularly, the particular gene that codes for the glucocorticoid receptor was highly methylated as a result of not being groomed. And because it was highly methylated, it wasn't transcribed as often. And so the expression of the GR gene was downregulated. And what this meant is that these offspring that were not groomed had higher levels of stress hormones, such as cortisol, and as a result, they demonstrated behaviors which indicated they had a high level of anxiety. And when it came time to be parents themselves, they themselves were parents that did not groom their offspring and they did not lick them very often. So this was a trait that was not really present in the genes per se, but was perpetuated to the next generation because of the presence of epigenetic marks. So a big picture here is that epigenetic marks don't have to do with the DNA itself, but that are marks that are added to or removed from the DNA that determine whether or not a particular gene will be expressed. And remember, these epigenetic marks, in some instances, can actually be inherited from generation to generation. So what you're exposed to in your lifetime can actually affect the genes of the offspring and your offspring's offspring. So if you're interested in the subject of epigenetics, I would suggest that you click on the link below to watch a pretty long video called A Ghost in Our Genes, and it's all about epigenetic marks and how they turn genes on and off in our bodies. Okay, before we wrap up this lecture, we're going to talk about a couple different types of genetic disorders, and we're also going to talk about the methods used to screen for these disorders.
So the first of these disorders is something you're probably familiar with called Down syndrome. Now, Down syndrome is caused by an individual having three copies of chromosome 21. And this happens as a result of something called non-disjunction. That is, during meiosis, we have an irregular division of the chromosomes to where one cell gets too many chromosomes and the other cell gets too few. As a result, it's possible to have an offspring that has three chromosome 21s. Now, people would tend to think, well, you know, if two copies of a chromosome is good, three copies is better, but that's not the case. Usually having too much DNA, too many chromosomes is fatal. Oftentimes it leads to spontaneous abortion of that embryo. But it's only for a couple of chromosomes that it's not fatal, and chromosome 21 is one of those exceptions. If you have three chromosome 21s, you will exhibit the Down syndrome trait. So you'll have a child that has the characteristic facial features, heart disorders, and they're also going to have a slow mental development. Now, having non-disjunction happening and having a child with Downs, as you probably well know, is correlated with a mother's age. But we're also realizing that the non-disjunction that occurs that gives rise to that zygote with too many chromosomes could just as well have come from the father. But the reason that we worry about Down syndrome more in older mothers is that younger mothers tend to abort those trisomy 21 embryos uh, pretty frequently, whereas an older mother, for whatever reason, her reproductive tract tends to retain those embryos. And so that's why older mothers are more likely to have a Down's child than younger mothers. Another type of disorder that can be caused by non-disjunction is something called Klinefelter syndrome. Now, Klinefelter syndrome happens when we have too many X chromosomes. We have somebody, instead of having an XX or an XY, they are XXY. That is, they have two X chromosomes and one Y chromosome. Now, these individuals are sterile. That is, they cannot produce functional eggs or sperm. Uh, they do have a penis, but they also have uh, very female-like features. They have female hips, buttocks, etc. They may even have breasts. But again, they tend to be sterile. They may also have very slow mental development. And it's all because they have too many X chromosomes. So Down syndrome and Klinefelter syndrome are just two examples of genetic disorders. In fact, there are a lot of different types of genetic disorders that a child can have. And because many of these can be life-threatening, we tend to screen infants and newborns in the hospital. For example, in Hawaii, we screen for something called PKU, or phenylketonuria. In these individuals, they don't have the ability to metabolize the amino acid phenylalanine. As a result, they have these metabolic byproducts that build up in their tissues and eventually cause uh, liver problems and mental retardation. And so if we screen for these early enough, we can reduce the amount of phenylalanine in these children's diets, and therefore they can have a somewhat normal development. So the big picture is that we do screening for genetic disorders, particularly ones that we can change or alter that child's lifestyle to prevent them from coming down with a disease. So in addition to being able to test the newborns and infants for different types of genetic disorders, we can also look at the parents uh, to see whether or not they may be carrying a gene that may lead to a genetic disorder in the offspring. And there's basically two ways to do this. We can do it the old-fashioned way by creating a pedigree. A pedigree is simply a family tree where we look at the family tree and denote where on the family tree people have had a particular type of genetic disorder. Now, knowing this information, we can predict the chances that the parents are carriers for this trait and the chances that they will pass it on their offspring. We can also do blood tests and various DNA probes to detect the presence of unexpressed uh, recessive genes within your own genotype. And this is a little bit more high-tech and probably is a little bit more costly as well. Now, it's important to note that not all genetic disorders can be tested for in the parents uh, prior to conception. Again, Down syndrome is the prime example here because it's not really genetically inherited from the parents, but it happens because we have non-disjunction during the process of meiosis. And so remember that older females tend to be at higher risk for having a child that has Down syndrome. And so in this case, we might want to do some fetal testing because some parents want to screen for disorder uh, prior to that child being born. So either they can start planning to care for a child with special needs or they can choose to terminate the pregnancy if they need to.
And so there are two common methods of fetal testing, one called amniocentesis and the other one called chorionic villi sampling. And so we're going to talk about each of these procedures in some detail, but the big picture here is that both procedures involved some collection of fetal cells while they're still in utero, and both carry a small chance of spontaneous abortion because they do involve uh, the puncturing of the placenta or the puncturing of the amniotic membrane. Now, the first test that you're probably very familiar with is something called amniocentesis. Remember, centesis here means surgical puncture, and amnio refers to the amniotic sac. And so what happens during amniocentesis is that we take a syringe, often now guided by ultrasound probe, and we insert that through the abdominal wall into the amniotic sac. Now, the amniotic sac is full of fluid, but some of that fluid also contains fetal cells. And so we can withdraw a small amount of that fluid with a syringe and spin down that fluid to obtain a pellet of fetal cells. Now one thing we can do immediately with that fluid is we can uh, do a series of ELISA-based tests looking for proteins that are consistent, let's say, with a child that might have Down syndrome. So that's a biochemical test that can be done right away. On the other hand, those biochemical tests, they aren't 100% accurate. And so if we're doing amniocentesis, we're also going to culture some of those fetal cells that were collected and eventually grow them enough so that we can karyotype them and count the numbers of chromosomes. Now, a second type of fetal testing that's maybe a little less invasive is something called CVS, or chorionic villi sampling. Now remember, the chorionic villi was basically the embryo's contribution to the placenta. The placenta was this organ created by both maternal cells and fetal cells, and so if we can insert uh, a suction tube uh, into the placenta and suck off some of these chorionic villi, we can get some examples of fetal cells without perforating the amniotic sac. And so this tends to be a little bit safer than amniocentesis, but it doesn't come without its risks. So just like with amniocentesis, we collect some fetal cells. We can then do biochemical tests on the fluid that we collect, and we can also culture those cells and within several hours come up with a karyotype of cells and count the number of chromosomes. And again, if we see that that cell has 47 chromosomes, we know that we have some kind of non-disjunction disorder that's happened, and as a result, we are probably going to have a child with Downs or some other different type of disorder. Now, more recently, there's a third type of test that we can use to screen for disorders such as Down syndrome. And this test is called a nuchal scan. Now, a nuchal scan is a non-invasive test. Unlike amniocentesis or CVS, we don't have to puncture the amniotic sac or take little bits of the placenta. This test involves the use of an ultrasound probe, and we basically uh, do an ultrasound of the fetus, and we measure the fluid accumulation in the neck area and also the translucency of that area, because as it turns out, in many Downs fetuses, they get this accumulation of fluid in the nuchal region that is in the back of the neck. And so if we can measure the neck and look at the translucency of the fluid in the neck, we can get a pretty good idea whether or not this child might have Down syndrome. So the good thing about having a nuchal scan is that it's non-invasive and has virtually no chance of causing spontaneous abortion. The downside here is that nuchal scans are not 100% accurate. That is, it's possible to get a nuchal scan that indicates that your child might have Down syndrome, but then later on when that child is born, it may not have Down syndrome. So a lot of times if you get a nuchal scan that suggests your child has Downs, then you'll go ahead and have an amniocentesis or CVS done to go ahead and karyotype those cells. Okay, you've reached the end of the lecture on genetics. Just like all the other lectures, there will be a brief set of review questions following the lecture that you can use to assess your comprehension of the material. You will not be graded on these questions. However, if you get less than 70% correct, I do suggest you go back and review the lecture again and take more detailed notes in your textbook before going on to take this week's La Lima quiz. Now, this is the last lecture of the semester, and so I do urge you, if you haven't already, to go online and complete your eCafe surveys, because this is the way that I get valuable feedback from you, the students. This is particularly important for those of you that are in the online classes, who I probably haven't gotten a chance to meet. So please log on to eCafe and fill out the survey, and be sure to give me written comments, suggestions, or criticisms, because those are the most helpful in revising course content for future semesters. As always, if you have any questions, please email me at langston at or give me a call on my cell phone, 429-6218.